The Gospel of Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24. I'll begin reading at the third verse. And it says this. And as he sat at upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming? And of the end of the world. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Take heed that no man deceive you. Now remember, now we read that first verse. You gotta remember now Jesus is answering, he's giving them answers to three questions. Not just one question, but he's answering three questions. They want to know first what when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of their coming and the end of the world? Jesus answered and said, Take heed that no man deceive you. <clears throat> Verse 5. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Verse 7. For nation shall rise against nation. Sound like something that's going on in Ukraine, doesn't it? For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. And all these are the beginning of sorrow. Then shall they de deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Verse 10. And then shall many be offended. Say offended. offended. Say offended again. Would you take this? Say offended. I'm trying to find a spot here. I can't get nobody's attention. And then shall many be offended. That word offended, I need you to understand, is keldalon in the Greek. And we are to get our, that's where we get our English word scandal from. Scandalon. And we get that word scandal. It means that many is going to be trapped. Many are going to be trapped. Trapped in what? Trapped in religious tradition, shouting, praise breaks, no word, and systems that don't produce any powerful results. Verse 10, and then shall many be offended or trapped and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another, and many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure until the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Pay close attention to verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom, not salvation, but this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all of the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. I want to talk this morning for the next few brief few moments that the West Campus is giving me and allowing me to speak. And look at a neighbor and tell a neighbor, say, neighbor, time to produce the evidence. Come on, tell your neighbor, say, it's time to produce the evidence. It's, 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 it's an interesting thing as we look at our world around us and as we look at the things that are happening in the world and in its systems. It's an interesting thing to notice that, that the things that Jesus articulated would be happening they're happening right now, happening in greater propensity and greater intensity. One of the things that Jesus said would occur as the end approaches. He said, there will be distress of nations with perplexity. In other words, he said, there would be challenges that would begin to arise in the systems of this world, in nations among ethnic groups and among governments, he said not only would there be challenges with perplexity, in other words, there will be dilemmas. Somebody said dilemmas. There will be challenges that seemingly have no solutions, 
there will be difficulties that seemingly have no resolve. And no matter how educated and erudite and how uh, elevated consciousness and intellect may be, it will seem to us and to everyone around us that there is no solution to certain things. Understand that these are the days in which we're living in. And although things have always been slightly perplexing and slightly difficult, they are getting more difficult and more intense in our day. We are seeing the various things that Jesus uh, prophetically declared coming to pass now with greater intensity. And it's interesting to me now, it's interesting that these things may occur, uh, begin to occur. Leaders in various areas of the world construct are beginning to look for answers everywhere and finding that they do not have the answers to their own situations. Now, as a child of God, this should not surprise you. You shouldn't be moved by what you see on CNN and ABC and CBS. And you should not be shaken by this. Why? Because Jesus told us that these things would happen. Mm -hmm. And so when families and pest famines and pestilence like coronaviruses and RASV and flu begin to escalate, people are getting nervous. They're selling out all the items like like uh, that medicate for a cold and flu and fevers from infants all the way to senior citizens and folk think that the only place the virus hangs out is at the church house <laughs> and they want to know if we're nervous at new life about being back among the saints no we're not nervous because we're part of the witness protection program now, now is the time for the believer in Christ Jesus to stand up and give evidence to that fact. That God, that the God we say we serve is real. That the God we say we serve can do anything but lie. And there is a difference and a distinction between those who believe his word and those that don't believe his word. Come on, help me, preach this. Tell the neighbors and neighbor, I'm one of the ones who's seen the word of God manifest in my life. One of the things about reading the word of God is, is that the word of God gives us insight into the plans of God. And the ways by which God accomplishes those plans in the kingdom, uh, we're going to be able to find out in the days coming ahead. Would you allow me just for a few moments to digress and go to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 25, and beginning at the 14th verse. I'm going to be sharing out of the NIV, but follow along with me, if you will. If you have a, a Bible app on your phone, it's all right if you go to it, to the NIV. It may read exactly what I'm saying. Again, the Bible says... It, it will be like a man going on a journey. Now, I, I know of you, we're going to get into this story, and a lot of you already think you can preach this story. You think you understand this story, and you relate it to finances, but now he's not dealing with finances, and I need to bring you up to date on what God's talking about. Look what he says, and again, it will be like a man going on a journey. He called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. Remember, my topic is now time to produce the evidence. Now, 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 wait a minute. Jesus is talking about the kingdom, and the parable is, the, is only a way of ana, 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 I'm trying to, to my tongue, ana, 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 analogizing. My tongue just won't work right yet, but hand, hand on the kingdom. Uh, that the kingdom should be like <laughs> that, because I don't want the story to take precedence over the kingdom. In other words, he's using this, the story as a point of reference so that you won't take what the story says, face value, and take it and disregard the mention of the kingdom. Because the story is just an illustration to show you how things work and operate in the kingdom of God. Verse 14, again, it is like a man going on a journey who has called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. He has just got through talking about the five wise virgins and the five foolish virgins ahead of this. Again, an analogy helping him to understand the kingdom. Look at it, the neighbor and say, neighbor, I'm in the kingdom. 
department heads and your staff this morning because we're putting you in place on next Sunday. It's important that you pay a close attention to this message. If you have a job, if you have a business, it's important that you pay close attention to this message. Come on, tell another neighbor, say, I'm in the kingdom. Yeah. To one, he gave five bags of gold. To another, two bags. And to another, one bag. Each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. Each one according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold, watch what, he, what happened. He went at once and put his money to work and gained five more bags. <clears throat> uh, so also the one with two bags gained uh, of gold gained two more. And okay, so he had now made four. But the man who had received one bag, now watch him now, went off, dug a hole in the ground. And hid his master's money. Now, in the King James Version, it says talents. It doesn't matter what it is. But whatever it is that God gave you, you hid. Whatever God gave you and you hid it, that's what I want you to get. I don't want you to really picture a bag of gold and worry about the gold. But whatever it is that he gave you. Verse 19 says, after a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled the accounts with them. That means that everything that God gives you, you're going to have to give an account for what you did with what he gave you. He, what he gave you, not an excuse, not a complaint, not a criticism. You're not going to be able to talk to God about your haters. Uh, I would have done this if, if except for my, no, 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 no. I invested in you. And you got to get to this point now that you understand when I come in the kingdom of God, God has made an investment in me. Come on, tell your neighbor, say God made an investment in you. Then the man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. 100% return. His master replied, well done to you, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things, a few things, a few things, a few things. What you have been working with, God said, I just, it's just practice. Everything that you've been doing up to this point, I want you to understand in your life is just practice. It's just practice. 2021, 20, 22, all of that was just practice. Look at somebody and say, it's just practice. He's just testing you with what you've been working with because I'm going to put you in charge of many things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share your masters in your master's happiness. 22, the man with two bags of gold also came and said, Master, he said, uh, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You, you, you have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. All my faithful people here ought to shout. I got any faithful people in here. All my faithful people ought to shout out. All my faithful people ought to shout out. This means that being faithful, you are not just being faithful for faithful's sake. Uh, that, that, that being faithful is a test for promotion. Are uh, you hearing me? And that if you are faithful over a few things, faithful means doing it when you don't feel like it. Faithful means doing it when it's hard. Faithful means doing it when you, when you don't get credit for it or you don't get acknowledged for it. Faithful means going beyond convenience and spasmodic response and occasional commitment. Faithful is longevity, long-term, consistently serving without anybody giving you a pat on the back. He said, if you be faithful over a few things, I'm going to put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. Verse 24, then the man who had received one bag of gold came. He said, Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid. Now remember now, this is the kingdom principle we're dealing with. He said, so I was afraid. I was afraid I acted out of my feelings. And I went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here's what belongs to you. Now, now you need to understand something. And I thought about this alone. Being afraid of losing is not his problem. Being afraid of winning is his problem. 
Are you hearing me? Not being afraid of losing. See, a whole lot of folk now in the days that we're living in now, uh, they're afraid of winning. Uh, uh, they get a house and before long they, get, they, they won't make the payments because they don't believe they deserve the kind of house that they're living in. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You got friends, but all, all of a sudden you do things to mess with your friendship because you can't, you're afraid of winning with them. So now, you, they, they, now you've lost your friends. You, you, you got a job. You go to work, but you're doing things. You're tardy. You don't come on time. You're doing the things not to lose your, work, lose your job. And now you're telling everybody they just fired me because they don't like me. Why? Because they are really afraid of winning. They're not afraid of losing, but they're afraid of winning. His master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. Listen, in 2023, and everyone in this room, it's 2023, and everyone in this room, and everyone, if there's someone in the overflow, and everyone in the E-Church, you all have one thing in common. Regardless of their socioeconomic level in life, their ethnicity, their background, their influence, their intellect, their education, regardless of any of that, they have one thing in common. And that is the common denominator that equalizes us all in this particular moment that we're sitting in. We have in common an opportunity. We have in common a chance. Are you hearing me? It might not be what you prayed for. It might not be what you asked for. It may, you, you may have prayed for a thing or for a person or a place or a thing or a time. But often when you ask God for objects, he answers with a chance. He answers with an opportunity. And then as God answers with a chance, you, uh, you at your own discretion have the opportunity as to how you respond to that particular chance. The kingdom Jesus is teaching us here is about the transference of opportunity. It's about transference of chance to produce the evidence. For God to allow me to have a chance is absolutely amazing. It's just mind-blowing that God gives me a chance. It's amazing because most people give only chances to certain people. But in this story, God has so switched things around that that least likely have an opportunity to do the almighty. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? That the least likely one to succeed has an opportunity to do the almighty. I might not have been, my God might not have time to get back to Matthew 24, but hang in here, let's walk for another 10 minutes. The good news is God says the kingdom is likened unto a man who called his servants, his slaves together and gave them bags of gold. Wait a minute, that sounds off to me because you don't entrust wealth to slaves. You don't entrust your wealth to slaves. I want you to understand that there is nothing in the background of the slave that prepares them to execute on the level of decisions that are necessary to manage what has been allocated under them. So it's a blessing, but it's also a burden. It's powerful, but it's also painful. It's stimulating, but it's also scary. That these three men would be selected is a compliment. But then the compliment creates chaos. Whenever God compliments you with a chance, expect certain feelings of chaos to go along with the chance. Uh, that's how you know it's God. That's how you know it's him. It makes no, if it makes sense, it's not God. Whenever God does a thing, it does not make sense to my mind. It jerks you out of the parameters of what you have allocated as your narrative and your normative and puts you in a place where you are dependent upon him in a way that you wouldn't ordinarily be dependent upon him because God is not just going to give you that which you are prepared for, but often you are scared of. Y'all won't talk back to me this morning. Uh, but if God doesn't give you things that you are scared of, then faith does not have a job. 
because I don't need faith to do what I already know how to do. <laughs> I don't need faith to be a slave. I've been a slave when the story started. So I don't need faith to know how to be a slave. I don't need faith to be a slave. I need faith when you take me out of my comfort zone and away from what is familiar with me and put me in a position for which there is nothing on my resume that brings me into alignment with what you are about to do in my life. Am I talking to somebody good this morning? Uh, I don't know whether you know it or not, but I'm prophesying unto you. I haven't taken the time to say, yea, thus said the Lord. I have not told, uh, taken time to say, I've got a word from the Lord that's going to come your way. But I'm prophesying to somebody in this room already. I'm speaking a word to you about what God has been setting you up for. He's been getting you ready to shift you into a realm that you won't feel prepared for. I wish I had five people to look at somebody and tell them, I got a chance. Uh, it may not look like I have that chance right now, but I got a chance. I know my clothes that I'm wearing don't say I got one, but I got a chance. I know my God, my car don't tell me I have a chance, but I got a, I got a chance. That's why the enemy is after your, after your feelings of hope. He's after your hope because if you have no hope, faith has nothing to do. Are you hearing me? If you have no hope, faith has nothing to do. So faith is then the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things that you don't see. But if you're not hoping for anything, if he can kill your hope, if he can convince you to stay in your place, if he can get, convince you to shut your mouth, if he can get you to give up on your dream, if he can get you to be get so discouraged that you terminate everything that God had out there in front of you, then faith doesn't have a job because you have no hope that's why all the voices are talking in your head that's why every time you get in the park and there's a voice telling you you're fake you you you're not no department head and you're you're an imposter you'll never be a good mother you'll never be a good husband you'll never be a good wife the devil is only lying to you so whatever it is that's been that he's been telling you you're the opposite of that if he'd been telling you you're stupid, you're smart. If he'd been telling you you're broke, you're rich. He's a liar and he can. His grandmama is a liar. And so whatever he says, I want you to believe the opposite so your faith can get back on its job. Tell your neighbor, say, I'm a completer. Tell another neighbor, say, I got a chance. I got the clothes. Now the kingdom is likened unto this because God will raise up the unlikely to do the almighty. And he wants to, to you to start talking on the level you are not seeing. Let the poor say I'm, I'm ready. Let the weak say I'm strong. Whatever you're feeling, he wants you to start talking those things that are not as though they were because they will become whatever you say they will become. For as a man thinketh, as a man thinketh, for as a man thinketh, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Come on, look at a neighbor and say, neighbor, I got a chance. I may be 60, but I got a chance. I may be 40, but I got a chance. I got a chance, my God, going back to school. I've got a chance of getting my house. I've got a chance of coming out of debt. I got a chance to get my children to grow. I got a chance to get a good husband. I got a chance to get a good wife. Come on, tell the neighbor, say, I got a chance. Now, 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 now. Notice now. Notice now that the master gave them bags of gold and then he went on a long journey. Our first encounter with these three men, they're servants, they're slaves. They were slaves and being offered to be stewards. It takes a lot of faith for a slave to receive the master's wealth. See, I can offer you my car, but you got to receive it. I can offer you my house, but you've got to receive it. Uh, I can offer you, come on, I can offer you $5, but you got to, you got to. It takes a lot of faith for a slave to receive his master's wealth. 
because he has not seen himself in that particular light. Can you see yourself with what God is trying to give you? Can you see yourself with what God is trying to push in your face and put in your hands? Uh, and here these three men are given the opportunity to handle the wealth uh, that they didn't even work for and that they did not even own. So when you understand that they were slaves turned into stewards, uh, they were slaves and then he gives them wealth uh, which makes them stewards. So they have gone from servitude to stewardship. So in the kingdom, everything starts with service. In the kingdom, everything starts with service. So all you who start as spectators, uh, you're missing the transfer. If you started as spectators, you're missing the transfer because you got to go from being a spectator to serving because when you start serving you get God's attention you get on God's roller decks and he pulls you up closer to the front of the line are you hearing me uh, so some of you only start want stage but you don't want the service I don't know who came over this morning and opened up about 7 o'clock so that the saints could come in in a comfortable building but a whole lot of you only want the stage but you don't want the service you're saying I'll never get up and come here by get up at 6 to be here by 7 so that the saints could be comfortable no you want the stage but you don't want the service Even even now, we don't require our children to serve. So when you ask them to do something, their lips are poked out. Their lips are poked out. They're rolling their neck and they're turning their eyes at you. Are you hearing me? See, I grew up in a house where, where I was the dishwasher. My mama didn't have a dishwasher. I was a dishwasher. And when she wanted the television to change, I had to get up and go change the channel. I had to straighten out the clothes hanger with the aluminum foil on it so she could get a better picture. Y'all won't talk back to me here. She didn't have the remote control. She didn't have a remote control. I was the changer channel. So we're in, we're, we, we, we were in then the ethos of servitude. I grew up in the ethos of, of servitude. There's something that happens when you serve. That's so important uh, that the Bible said that after Jesus even uh, fed himself uh, and was getting ready to leave, the Bible said he got up and took off his garment uh, and prepped, had girded himself with a towel and he knelt down to serve. Uh, who do you serve? Who do you serve? I'm not asking you who you honor, but I want to know who do you serve? Department head and your staff, who do you serve? Who do you serve? We have lost the ethos of servitude. And we wonder why marriages don't last. We wonder why, because you can't serve and be selfish. The text starts out with servitude. And it's to the servants that the master places into stewardship. And hands one five bags of gold. And he hands another one two bags of gold. And he hands another one one bag of gold. Notice that after he gave it to them, he left. Notice now when he gave them the gold, he walked off on a learned journey. God will give you something that and not tell you what to do with it. He'll give you a baby, but he ain't going to tell you how to raise him. He'll give you a marriage, but he ain't going to tell you how it works. It's not like he told them what to do with the gold. It's not like he told them what to do with it. It's not like he told them, I want you to multiply what I gave you. It's, it's not that he told them what bank to make the investments in. Because he stopped talking to them like servants the moment they became stewards. Because, see, servants just follow commands, but stewards have to think. Servants follow commands, but stewards have to think. And God said for where he's getting ready to take you, you can't just follow commands 
and wait for doors to open for you, you're going to have to think and find creative ways to make the next move happen in your life. Your next move is in between your ears. Tap your neighbor, say your next move is hidden between your ears. When your head shifts, your life will shift. Come on, look at the neighbor, say evidence. Produce the evidence because you are stewards of a chance. You've been rewarded with a compliment. You've been rewarded with uh, because you've been obedient. But now you've got to be creative. We've come into 2023. I've run out of time, but now is the time that you've got to be creative. Creative without instructions. When we lay our hands on you, you got to now become creative without instructions. If I've got to stand over you and micromanage, I don't need you. There's some things, and I've always been this way, that if it's broke at the church, get rid of it. We don't need it around because anything around me that don't produce anything, you got to go. But now you've got to be creative without instructions. I came by to talk to you this morning, and I can't get back to Matthew 24, not today, uh, that it's time now to produce the evidence.